All right, hello. Uh, welcome to the Gen Con Writer Symposium panel on agents, on how to find an agent. Um, before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please, please, this is important, turn in your Gen Con tickets. Uh, this allows the Gen Con folks to track attendance so that they can continue to support um, all of this great programming. Um, my name is Chris Bell. I'll be the moderator for this panel. Um, I help run a small press out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, it's a small indie press, so I don't have the, the pleasure to work with a lot of agents, and so I'm looking forward to uh, this panel to uh, learn a lot myself. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask all of the panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves, um, and then uh, I will ask uh, some questions. Uh, if you've seen me before in Gen Con panels, I'm kind of known to like free for all, let everybody go back and forth. But because we're online today, uh, I'll try to direct questions specifically to a panelist. And I'll ask the panelists if, if uh, you want to jump in, please just raise your hand. If it's really important, feel free to jump in. But otherwise, if, if I see you raise your hand, I'll know that, that you have a follow up uh, and I'll call on you uh, afterward. Um, as with all of the uh, writer symposium panels that I've been a part of, um, the panelists are just amazing. The 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 amount of expertise um, that we have here is I'm I'm really excited and looking forward to it. Um, um, a very uh, well known agent and some well known authors as well. So I'm going to just start off by letting everybody uh, introduce themselves. Um, let's start, uh, I guess I'll call because we didn't pick an order. I'll say, uh, Tony, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Sorry, I muted my microphone, but now it's back on. Hi, I'm Tony Kellner, um, and I'm also right as Lee Perry. I wrote mostly murder mysteries. I've written 11 murder mysteries as Tony Kellner, um, six as Lee Perry, and I've also co-edited a bunch of anthologies with Charlene Harris. I've had two agents. So I can kind of talk about getting one twice and firing one once. And um, I pretty much had an agent my whole career. Great, thanks. Uh, let's see, uh, Lucianne, you wanna go next? Sure, hi, I'm Lucianne Diver. I'm with the Knight Agency. I started my career 27 years ago at the at uh, Spectrum Literary Agency in New York. I moved 12 years ago to the Knight Agency and I represent science fiction, fantasy, mystery, suspense, romance, and young adult fiction. Um, I also am a writer in my own right. I write young adult, I write urban fantasy, I write young adult suspense, and I am a member of AAR, SFWA, MWA, RWA, pretty much all of the writers organizations out there. So I can talk of, from both sides of the fence, but I'm, I think, pretty much here to represent agentum. So that's me. Great, thank you. Uh, Maurice. Hello, my name is Maurice Broadus. I'm a mostly a science fiction and fantasy author. I've written about a dozen books, um, but uh, nearly 100 short stories. Uh, I'm also the editor over at uh, Apex Magazine, or one of the editors at Apex Magazine, and I uh, look forward to uh, chatting with everyone tonight. Great, thank you. Elaine. Hi, my name is Elaine Isaac. I also write as E.C. Ambrose. I'm the author of the Dark Apostle series, dark historical fantasy about medieval surgery. I'm kind of a research junkie. I also have traditional fantasy out as Elaine Isaac, and I write uh, international thrillers as E. Chris Ambrose, uh, called the Bone Guard series. I am currently working with my third agent, and my 13th novel will come out later this year. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so we've got a lot of experience on not just working with an agent, but working with multiple agents. And I know I have a, a question about that. Um, so before we get into how to get an agent, let's let's talk briefly about why to get an agent. Um, and, and I'll start this off with, with Tony. Um, as a writer, why do you want an agent? Why do you need an agent? Um, it's, it's for the big bucks, I swear, it's for the money. Uh, when I first started selling my books, my first book came out in 93, so I, I'm old. Um, so when my first book came out, I had an agent. I had gotten an agent over the transom. And at the same time, I was getting my agent. Um, and he, uh, she sold my books to Kensington, which is, they did a three-book contract. A friend of mine here in the Boston area, which is where I live, also got a three-book contract with Kensington at about the same time. 
she was offered less than I was right off the start and did not feel able to negotiate a higher price. I got offered more and my agent negotiated more. So she more than earned out her commission right there. Since then, it's I'm big into agents for the foreign rights and the auxiliary and the, the audio rights and all the, you know, maybe I can get a book into a bookstore and sell it, but I wouldn't know how to get it into a French bookstore, a German bookstore. So for all those things, I think, and, and you know, let alone the obvious things of an agent knowing what's selling, what editors are looking for and who to send to. So I swear by agents, not ad agents. Sorry, Lucien. You never okay. swear at agents? Occasionally I do swear at them, but mostly I swear by them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Elaine, how, do you want to add anything to that? What, why, what does an agent do for you? Sure. So I think of my agency relationship as being uh, about long-term career guidance and structure. My hope is to um, work with my agent to develop multiple career tracks. I am a multi-genre author, so that's one of the things that was important to me. Uh, as Tony said, I rely on them for uh, knowledge of contract terms and the ability to negotiate contract terms more strongly, especially um, some of the things that gets buried in the contract that authors don't necessarily think about, like option clauses. Uh, and it's an opportunity to get someone who's on my team and willing to play bad cop. So my relationship with my editor is about the creative aspects of making this the best book possible and how are we going to present this book to the public. And my agent is the one who steps in to say, okay, this won't work. We need you to respond to this promptly, you know, to sort of take care of the hardcore business aspects of things uh, and to kind of keep that a little bit separate from my editorial relationship and the creative aspects of the process. You, you said... Um some things that you might think about or think of. And Lucianne, I have a question for you then. Um, what are some things that an author starting out might be surprised to learn that agents do for them? Well, I think that a lot of people think that um, agents are heartless and we're really just about the negotiation. And that's all we really do is talk about terms. And that's certainly part of it. But I think one of the things that um, they're not necessarily aware that we do is really um, career planning. For instance, I'm negotiating a deal for a debut author now, and we've got multiple bidders. And one of the things we're talking about is not just terms, but this what this line can offer, uh, what that line can offer. So we're really talking about also strengths and weaknesses of the various lines, um, what they can do, what they're known for, who they publish, um, what, um, what their distribution is like, what their marketing, um, what their covers are like, what their just um, basically the pros and cons of the various lines um, and what might be the best line to launch this particular book. Um, so it's really when you're looking at um, a career, it's not just about the money and it's not just about taking the money and running. It's about what is going to be best to position and who is best positioned to um, really um, get a book out and get a book seen and get a book viewed um, in the right way to, um, to uh, set you up for success, not just for this book, but for the future books. So it's really about building a career and not just about a book or a launch. It's about a trajectory. And that's like the, the career planning that, that Elaine was telling, talking about. Um, so, you know, really we are, are in it for a career, not for the fast money and the fast break. We're in it for developing you over time. And, um, you know, w your success is our success. And it's, it's shared risk, but shared reward. And that's really where we're career managers as much as we are negotiators and as much as we are contract managers. So agents really wear many hats. Yeah, I, I was thinking uh, as I was planning for this panel, what the, the audience would be like. And, you know, normally I would ask for a show of hands. And so you can do that virtually, uh, the audience at home. Um, but I was thinking uh, how many were just starting out in their career and right off the bat say, I know I need an agent. I'm just getting ready to start writing my manuscript, but I also need an agent. 
versus somebody that is further along in the process or even somebody who has already indie published or self-published and then wants to get an agent. So my next question is for uh, Maurice. When was it that you decided you needed an agent? Ooh, um, so let's see. So it would have been 2009 that I think about it. Um, and so a, a lot of it is I actually didn't think I needed an agent for the longest time because, I mean, the business side of writing is a relationship business, and I have a lot of relationships, and um, and so I can get I could get my book into anyone's hands I wanted it to, to get into, and so uh, it was. So I actually sold my first book deal. Uh, it was a three book deal to Angry Robot, and right when they sent me this, what was it? It was like fourteen a fourteen page contract. It was in that moment I had the epiphany of maybe maybe I should have an agent at this point. Um, and so I, I got my agent uh, soon after that because uh, there was just no way I was going to go through that 14-page uh, contract. I, I would have to have someone like just thoroughly explain each of these clauses to me and what they meant. Um, and so that, yeah, so I ended up getting my first agent with the first contract. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to have a question about that 14-page contract. Okay. Um, <laughs> So that's a short contract. I yeah. say they've only gotten longer ever since. <laughs> now, are there are there any fourteen page agent agreements? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, agent agreements tend to be more like two pages, three pages, maybe yeah. five pages. They don't tend to be fourteen pages now. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Okay. So we, we've 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 set the baseline. We've decided we need an agent. Now let's get into the heart of this panel, which is how do you get an agent? And so uh, Lucianne, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce this back to you. Someone that's just starting out that says, okay, Maurice just got that 14 page contract. He's like, oh God, I need an agent. What's, what's the first step? Um, what's, where should you start uh, in your hunt for an agent and or what resources exist to help you? Well, I think uh, one of the great places, first of all, if you're already doing writers conferences like this, this is a great resource because you're meeting people, you're networking, um, you are, you know, already you know, agents who have gone to these, you know, uh, conventions, conferences, you already know that they're looking for, for fiction, the kind of fiction that you're writing. So that's a great place to start. Writers organizations, like if you're writing science fiction, CIPWA, the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, will have a list of agents that are reputable in that in that field. Horror Writers of America will have a list of, uh, you know, agents who handle horror. Mystery writers, same thing. Romance writers, same thing. Um, the Association of Authors Representatives will have a list of uh, agents who are members. Now, not all agents will necessarily be members of Association of Authors Representatives. For instance. Um, the, you know, our agency will have some of our agents who are members. It doesn't make sense for us to pay for all of our agents to be members because it's the same information and it doesn't make sense for all nine of us to pay uh, to get the same information. So there might just be one of us paying per year. Um, but you have to subscribe to the canon of ethics and um, you can get censured if you're not subscribing to that canon of ethics. And in order to get in, you have to have other member agents say, that they can recommend you. You have to show proven sales and things like that. So um, basically, writers organization, or I'm sorry, uh, professional organizations are a great, great place to start. Um, things like SIFWAs, predators, and editors show you about warning signs, things to look out for um, about agents. And then basically, do your research. Do your research out there, and then follow guidelines. That's the best piece of advice. Look on the agency's websites. There will be submission guidelines. Follow those guidelines. Don't try to skirt them thinking that you're special because that's the best way to have your query just thrown out or ignored because other people will be behave professionally, will follow those guidelines, and that's going to get the attention uh, because that's the way to behave professionally is to follow professional guidelines, and that's really the first hurdle. Okay, thanks. Um so do, doing your research, um, I, I'll point out, uh, Elaine, this next question is going to be for you, but I, I noticed that you blog quite a bit about um, selling a book or finding an agent. I actually read a blog post this morning about about the first time you, you got an agent agreement, I think, for Drake Master. Um, and so 
how did you do, how did you narrow down that focus? How, how did your search for an agent uh, go? Hmm. So it went a little bit differently each of the three times that I looked for an agent. Uh, the first time I had an offer on the table and uh, when the editor called to make the offer, I said, my agent will call you back. I hung up with the editor and then I got an agent, uh, sort of like where he's receiving the 14 page contract, except ideally the editor will know that there's an agent coming on board uh, before that contract is sent. So uh, at the time I had been doing the research, the very research that uh, Lucienne was just talking about, uh, reading things like Locus Magazine, Publishers Marketplace to see who was making deals for the kinds of books that my book would fit in well with. So I had sort of a short list of three names that I ended up submitting to uh, right away. One of them was uh, an editor who had recently left the editorial side and moved over to becoming an agent. One was a um, very well-known uh, agent at the time. And the third was a newer agent at a very established agency. So I called up each of those people. Ordinarily, I'm not much into cold calling, but when you can say, I have an offer on the table from and name publisher, anybody will take that call. <laughs> uh, you know, basically you're saying, I'm about to potentially offer you 15% of a contact I have already made in order to get your foot in the door and establish that long-term relationship that I was looking for. Uh, so very handy to have that offer out there. Uh, the second time, we can talk later on about how the agency's uh, partnerships fall apart, but uh, the second time I approached someone who had a very high reputation within the genre, uh, just from talking to my writing buddies, from attending conferences, I had seen her on a number of panels, so I was sort of familiar with what she did. And um, again, I had an offer on the table from a small press at that point, but there was potential interest from uh, the larger publishers. So I submitted to this agent directly, and she said, well, you know, this isn't quite my thing but there's someone else at my agency that I think would be really excited about this project. And in fact, that agent was. Um, so that was kind of my, my inroad. And the third time it was from an author recommendation from another friend of mine. This is a fantastic resource as you are networking and building your relationships with other authors, talk to them, say, you know, I'm looking for an agent. I put it out there. And in this case, uh, a friend of mine who wrote also historical fantasy said, oh my gosh, I love your stuff. And I think my agent would love it too. So she basically uh, sent a recommendation to her agent and said, look, Elaine's going to send you a manuscript that I think is going to be awesome because I love her work and I think you should give it a try. So. Okay. So, so I've, I've heard that the one way to get an agent is to get a big fat contract on your desk and then show it to an agent. Uh, Tony, was that your experience or did you did you go through a different path? Uh, no, I did not have any contracts or, or contacts either. Um, this was back when they would, the uh, Writer's Digest put out a book every year listing agents and publishers and where to get published. And I would go through that book and I sent to agents over, just sent them one page query letters. You know, some of them wanted to see more, some of them didn't. And that's how I got my first agent was going straight through one of those books. I did not meet her for several years since after we started doing business because it was all by phone then. It wasn't even email because I'm old. And they, um, they, you know, we would send letters. And I happened to be going to the town where she operated, which was Atlanta, unusual for an agent, I know. Um, and I was there to visit family and I met with her then. And that was the first time I ever met her. And we had been doing business for probably three or four years. So I, for, for people who say, you know, I can't afford to go to conferences or for whatever reason they can't go to conferences, they can't really, it's, it's easier to network now because you can network online. But even so, for anyone who doesn't have those opportunities or it doesn't have the, the knack for being friendly online, you can do it by sending people the letters. One thing I want to, uh, Lucian was talking about doing the research, as part of the research process for who you submit to, figure out what it is you're writing, whether it's young adult, whether it's adult fiction historical fantasy, are you more of a George or, or a Martin, or are you a Tolkien, or are you an E.C. Ambrose or Maurice, the what exactly, you know, so you can look for people who publish the kind, you know, look for their agents first. Well, they like E.C.'s, they're going to like mine, and wow, mine's just like Maurice's, not as good, of course, but still really good, um, and, and just to kind of get an, a, to pick out your targets more carefully, rather than just, I write science fiction and fantasy, he likes science fiction and fantasy, 
like Elaine's experience with uh, sending to someone in an agency who wasn't quite right, even though they were sort of in the zone. Yeah, and I and I heard uh, Lucianne talk about one of the resources. Kind of, I didn't I didn't quite catch the name, but it was almost like a writer's beware. But it was it was for agents that to be on the lookout that CIFWA has. Oh no! Well, the uh, it, it's not a beware thing, but the Association of Authors Representatives, the AAR. I think it's AAR. Oh, I I don't remember what the actual website is anymore. But it's Association okay. of Authors Representatives. And in order to be a member agent, and and any, um, like I said, if if any of the agents in the organization are member agents, then we subscribe to the canon of ethics. Um, but they have a canon of ethics that you have to subscribe to in order to be a member. And if you are a member and you break the canon of ethics, you can be censured. And and agents have been censured before mm -hmm. and been kicked out before. Um, so. Not every reputable agent is necessarily a member, but if somebody is a member, you know that they subscribe to the canon of ethics. And that if they don't, then they can be censured and kicked out. So it's not a beware site where you're warned necessarily like um, SIP was author beware site, but you know that somebody is um, subscribing to that canon of, canon of ethics if they are a member of the Association of Authors Representatives. It still doesn't mean they'll necessarily be the agent for you. Only you will know that through the research and everything else. But um, but it does at least mean that they subscribe to a certain canon of ethics. Okay, Elaine, I saw your hand up. Uh, well, Writer Beware posts listings basically of um, agencies or editors who have been problematic. Uh, Predators and Editors is another resource like that. Uh, where if they receive a number of complaints, they investigate those complaints and they'll basically say, oh, you know, this agent is actually um, a sham. They're taking money from authors. They're not submitting manuscripts, uh, that kind of information. Another resource like that is Absolute Right, W-R-I-T-E. They have a water cooler on their site uh, and you can often sort of find out the scuttlebutt if you're not someone who's really connected with a group of writers where you can sort of say, hey, have you heard of this agent that I'm interested in? What do you know about them? And Absolute Right is another place where you can often find out more information about what those agency relationships are like and receive warnings if it's someone who is not um, following those best practices. Okay, thanks. I, that was it. Um, Maurice, um, so we talked about um, finding a good fit. Uh, and it seems like a lot of a lot of word of mouth, a lot of personal contacts, going to events, reaching out. Um, you you posted a on on a blog uh, many years ago um, about uh, some of your rules for finding an agent. And I think it was right before you got an agent, and you were you these were some of the things to help you find a good match. But you had one called the Randy Moss rule of agents, and. I'll let you uh, describe as much of that as you would like, but I'd also ask if you, you know, how how is it that you were able to find a, a good match or find a, an agent that that matches your needs as well? Yeah, uh, wow, that goes way back. I think that was a, a blog post from 2008, um, which, there you go, kids. The internet is forever, so your words can uh, follow you for a while. Um, and my my rant, I, I think I had like three or four rules I was look or, or things I was look or two, things to avoid in an agent, and uh, the number one rule was the Randy Moss rule, which is you know I'm, I want to find an agent who's not on the side dealing crack, um, you know so, you know there's just some fundamental things I'm looking for in the relationship, and maybe don't sell crack. Uh, should be well, there. There goes my weekend job. <laughs> See, I know I understand. Everybody has to have a side hustle, but uh, you know. Uh, maybe don't do crack. Uh, that, I think that was like my number one uh, rule. Um, but fi finding a good fit, it, uh, again, some of it's been been said in terms of finding, uh, you know, my first couple agents uh, I, I found through word of mouth and had to release them uh, for, for different reasons. Um, but then my most recent agent who I've been with since 2012, um, yeah, t since 2012, I met her at a convention. Um, we were at a Worldcon together. Um, I was in the bar. I was wearing, uh, you may not know this, but I, I have a, a penchant for very loud red suits that I am prone to wearing at, at conventions. And uh, and so I was at, at the bar in, in the red suit and she comes up and she's just like, 
that's who the owner of this suit needs to, needs a drink and I can expense all of my drinks. And uh, and so she said that. And I said, if you can expense all of your drinks, I'm never leaving your side. And, uh, and we had no idea who each other were. Uh, you know, it was, wasn't until later we even found out that, you know, the, I was I revealed I was a writer and she revealed she was an agent. Um, but th but that that was actually one of the things I didn't realize I was looking for was and which now is my number one rule is, look, I'm looking for someone to build a partnership with. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, I mean, we're, we're forming a relationship together and I want to make sure I at least I want to be able to get along with the person who I'm entering into this partnership with. And uh, and she and I had such a great rapport. And we ha still have this great rapport to, till today. I mean, now, granted, you'll often hear us arguing like an old married couple. But uh, but that's what I wanted in a, in, in a in an editor, in an agent was uh, someone who because uh, I know for me personally, I require a lot of hand holding. And uh, so I needed someone who what, had more of a relational edge to her, uh, and as opposed to you know someone who's hard nose. I'm just about the dollars, just about the dollars. That that's actually a secondary concern for me. My my first concern is always relational. So uh, so she passed that first hurdle completely inadvertently. Oh man. Uh, so Lucienne, how how far does that personal interaction go when finding an agent as opposed to just sending a query letter? And I want to talk about query letters next, but it sure sounds like a, a handshake before before a query letter might go a, a really long way. How, how do you feel about that? You know, it really depends. Um, my authors have come to me all different ways. Um, and, and authors are all different ways. I have um, one writer who's such a recluse, he doesn't even like to talk on the phone. Um, he's he's actually so uncomfortable on the phone. He prefers everything in email and we've never met in person. And we've, I think, talked on the phone five times in the year I've re years I've represented him. Um, I, I think I only call him for offers <laughs> and he's not even really com so that so comfortable for that. We, we really only talk on the phone when it's absolutely necessary. Um, so so really, it it depends on the author and the needs of the author. Um, so, so yes, sometimes that is really, really important. Um, and sometimes it, it isn't it really, again, all depends. And, um, it doesn't mean we don't have a rapport. It just means that that rapport is, um, up to the person to set the boundary. And, um, so some authors I'm extremely conversational with, um, and I, you know, I may know their cats' names and their kids' names and everything else. And some, um, I may not even know their home address. <laughs> well, that's not necessarily true. There are some tax forms and things like that where that's required. But, um, but you know, it, it really depends. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's really dependent. So yes, there are some people who've come to me with recommendations and there are some where we don't get off the phone in under an hour and there are some where we hardly ever get on the phone at all. So um, I think, it's it's important, but it's also Im important to um, be where everybody is comfortable. And there are boundaries and you have to respect them and they have to respect yours. And so it's gonna be different for everybody that you're dealing with. Yeah, uh, um, Elaine, you, um, uh, you, you've you written, uh, like I said, you've written a lot of uh, blog posts about, about this. Can you can you walk us through what a, what a query, so let's say you, 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 you need to write a query letter. Um, what goes into it? What what is a query letter? What are the basic basic parts of it? And uh, and then I'm going to ask a follow up. Sure. So what you're mainly looking for is uh, why I'm approaching you. What the general concept of this book is about? Where it's going to fit in the marketplace? And then what makes it stand out from the marketplace? What we think of as the same but different. So this fits in the marketplace in the this kind of niche, but here is how I've changed it up. Here is how I've made it personal, made it exciting and made it my own. I typically, when I'm writing those kind of query letters, like to begin with a version of my elevator pitch. It's just a one sentence encapsulates who the principal character is, what major conflict they're facing, and then a sense of the setting where it's taking place. So uh, in 14th century England, a barber surgeon discovers that uh, he has special access to the magic of death. Um, might be an example. So it tells you that it's a historical fantasy. It tells you that it's probably going to be kind of a dark edge, and it gives you a sense a little bit about who that protagonist might be. 
then later on I'll have a longer paragraph where I spend a little bit more time about it. Uh, usually the end of that letter is a little bit about you as a writer. And if you have publishing credits already, if you've sold some short stories, awesome, that's where you put that. Maybe you attended a workshop, uh, maybe you have a master's degree or MFA and one of those kinds of programs. So that's where you would incorporate that. Uh, at the beginning, after I give that one sentence summary, is usually the, I'm approaching you because. Uh, because we met at the bar at Worldcon that time and we had a great time talking. Or because your client so-and-so recommended you as an agent and thought you might be interested in my work. Uh, it sort of gives it that personal edge so that it's not just your agent, I found your name in Publishers Marketplace and you sold a book for a million bucks and I want a million bucks too. All right, thanks. I, th I think that's the end. Uh, your video's breaking up just a little bit, so uh, oh. forgive me if I'm jumping in on you there. Um, when you talked about uh, when you talked about the synopsis of of your book, um, how does that differ if it's going into a query letter to an agent versus you're putting on your website for readers? That's that's to Elaine again. If not, we can, somebody else can jump in. I guess what I'm getting at is, do, do you when you're and and if and if you're not hearing me, somebody else can jump in. But the, the if mm -hmm. if you're if you're writing a, 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 a you know a pitch to to a reader about your book, you, you might you know put some cliffhangers or why I want to read more. Is it the same for an agent, or do you want to give them you know all the details, including uh, you know. Uh, um, you know, surprises. So agents are also readers first. Uh, and usually with a query letter, my goal is to hook them and get them excited about the work. For the actual synopsis that I would send along with a submission, or sometimes if they ask for a couple of pages or a sample and a synopsis that goes along with your submission package, then I would definitely want to include the ending and include the surprises because they need to know that you can tell a complete story, beginning, middle, and end. Um, so the one paragraph summary that I included in my query letter is probably pretty similar to what would appear on the back of the book. Get them excited, show them what the genre is, suggest some of the big problems that are gonna come up and what's gonna make this book exciting and stimulating for readers. And then when I do my complete synopsis, which might be even as short as a page, I would make sure that I include those big twists and then I include the ending to say, look, here's a complete thing. You can trust me to tell this story, especially if it is an unfinished manuscript then they're going to want to know that uh, they're signing you up with those 50 pages or those first 100 pages of a book, but you're going to be able to carry it off and bring it to an end. Uh, Lucienne, how how far along in the, should the, um, the manuscript be developed before approaching an agent? Oh, it should absolutely be complete and not just complete, but polished. It should be uh, not, not first draft, not second draft, but, uh, you know, like, fifth draft at least. I mean, it should be um, written and and revised and then have another pair of eyes, uh, at least one, probably multiple, you know, and then uh, revised based on feedback. So really, you're going to be too close to your own work to have um, a really clear idea of whether you conveyed what you meant to convey, because you know what you meant to say. You know what was intended in here, but you have no idea whether somebody else coming on it fresh is going to read the message that you think that you put down on the page. So you need somebody else to complete the circuit and see if uh, if the power is getting through. And um, and then they need to tell you where the power is failing, where, where the, the circuit is not complete. And then you need to revise and, and rework things. And, uh, and you need to do all of that before the agent sees it. And that's going to take a few tries and, and more than a few tries, especially as a debut. Um, because um, later in your career, and even later in your career, and the, other, and the other authors can speak to this, nobody is sending their first draft into their editor or their agent. Um, they're sending in, you know, um, later drafts after they've revised and they, even they've had critique partners um, or other people look at it. Um, and, and, but, but later in your career, you've got editors that you've worked with their voices in your head and, and your critique partner's voices in your head. 
and you've got all these people in your head helping you make it better even without them looking at it because you know what they would say and you you know the flaws that you've had in the past and you're already working on them as you go and so you get better as you go because you're hopefully not making the same mistakes and uh, you may be making new ones but you're also trying more ambitious things but in any case you're you're not sending your first draft or your third draft but you're sending a really polished workout so not just finished but but really refined and that's the point at which you're going to seek an agent because if they like your query they're going to ask to see your full manuscript and you're going to want to put your best foot forward because you're not going to have another chance at them um so you've got your polished manuscript and you you've had it reviewed you've had it edited you've probably have you, you had a lot of eyes look at it uh question for tony how do you get your um your query letter or your pitch reviewed or looked at or edited or what what resources exist for that um gosh I, i've been i it's been so long since i've done a query letter because when i got my second agent it was very much we had worked together on the anthologies I did. I co-edited anthologies with Charlene Harris, and I, I got to know her agent. So when it was time to um, to change agents, I just talked to him and said, are you interested? He said, yes, and it was, I didn't do a query letter. If I were going to get a query letter read these days, I would go to the same people who do my beta reading, which I've, I've got a couple of beta readers. I've got my, I've got an alpha reader with my husband, um, the alpha dog and the alpha reader both. And I should, uh, and I would go to people like that, but I haven't had a, to do a, a rough query letter to go for an agent in a long time. When it comes to a query letter for a publisher, like I'm working on a new project now with my agent, and we've gone back and forth over the pitch and um, to, to get it to the point where it, it's cleaned up, but that's after that fact, that's after I've got an agent. Okay. Um, uh, Maurice, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll ask you this one. Um, it, and it sounds like all all three of the authors here, and Luciana, I know you're you're also an author, but but I'll say that in the in the capacity in this uh, this panel, uh, have had multiple agents. Um, and Maurice, I know you you had to part ways with your first agent. Um, how do you approach that? What's the you know how, how do you how do you end that relationship? And then what's it like? trying to find a new agent, how does that, how does finding the second agent differ from the, from the first one? Um, <clears throat> well, the, the party, so I've had to part ways with two agents total. Well, actually three, but one parted herself due to some of her own antics. Um, but uh, the two I had to part ways with, one I had to part ways with just because she was no longer uh, reading and sending out my stuff uh, in, a, in a timely way. So then it's like, well, you know what kind of good are you doing for my career if uh, if if you're not doing the basic things of like you know reading the stuff I send you, um, and so so I parted with her, with her uh, a while back. But uh, my agent, uh, but the agent who uh, who you're talking about, um, as it turns out, uh, agents are human, which uh, threw me off. I know, I know, it shocked me too. Uh, but you know. Uh, he he uh, he had experienced a loss in his life and and had kind of just crawled into the depression hole, and uh, and you know and I, I was trying you know and like I said I'm a relationship guy first and so I was uh, waited out as long as I could for him to to come out of it but I mean after the first year or so, uh, you know at some point I'm like look <laughs> I can't put my career on hold forever I'm still going to be your friend and we're friends to this day, um, but I need to move on with an. Uh, for the sake of my career, so I, so we have to part ways professionally, but that doesn't mean we're parting ways personally, and, and that's basically the way I put it to him. And he was just like, "Look, I'm surprised this didn't come sooner." Um, and frankly, as your agent, I would have recommended that you do this sooner. Um, <laughs> so uh, so there's that. Uh, but you know, and so that's how we parted ways. Was you know, there comes a point where you have to go. Look, is are, are my needs professionally being met? If they're not, let's end this partnership move on um and it just so happened that you know while i was while we were going through this was when i bumped into jen at uh at Worldcon. so it's like okay it seems like the timing was just right and so this was meant to happen so it, it all worked out well 
but even then, before she uh, before she even took me on, uh, going back to what Lucienne was saying about the canon of ethics, she wanted to make sure that there was a suitable time from when I had parted with my my previous agent before she would take me on. So uh, there was that sort of uh, I don't know what I'd call it, maybe a grieving period or whatever, but there was that period so that uh, there was so it didn't look like she was trying to po uh, poach me or something like that. So you know, I part there was a clean break. We waited. Then we picked up a new relationship with a new project. Okay, thanks. Um, did uh, anybody here on the panel, uh, Indy or self, publish uh, a novel before getting represented by an agent? So you can just raise your hand if you had. Okay, so I'll throw this to Lucienne. Do you have any advice for somebody that that started off? That says I don't need an agent. I'm going to do this alone. Um, I'm going to I'm going to sell my own book uh, online, and and later decided that they they really want to go a more traditional route. Need an agent to help them. Um, any advice for them on how to approach an agent after they've already had a somewhat of a self publishing career? Um. There's, you know, there's no one path. I have authors who have done that, that started out indie and are now um, hybrid. They haven't given that up. They're, they're doing, um, they're being traditionally published and also indie published. Um, you know, I, my only real advice is that remember that no matter what you do, you're building up a track record. So when you, when you do indie publish, just make sure that you are putting out really good Again, make sure you're revising and you're refining and you're getting it copy edited and you're doing professional covers and just professional work because whatever you do is um, you're leaving a, a track record. You're putting it out for readers. They're putting it out for, you know, they're reviewing. Um, they're remembering um, the first thing that an editor is going to do is go look if you're getting one star reviews because it was badly edited and badly you know, there, there are typos all over the place or whatever. I mean, first of all, that's the first thing an agent is going to do is go look. But then certainly the first thing an editor is going to do is go look. So you're you're building a track record and you're building up expectation. Um, so whatever you do, do it professionally. And if you're, if you're not doing it professionally, then you're not ready to be a professional. So, but if you've done that, and I'm going to assume that that's what you're talking about, somebody who's done that and done it very professionally, um, then then, you know, go for it. Uh, just, just um, you know, just be professional, but just um, uh, also know though that, um, that sales, um, uh, that sales as indie or self-published uh, do not necessarily translate the same way because the price point is different when you're self-publishing than when you're traditionally published. Um, there's just, there's, it's, it's just a, a completely different paradigm. So there are going to be different expectations. So um, just remember that it's a it's a different ball game, and um, you probably should not be going out soliciting um, a traditional publisher for something that you've already self-published. The chances that somebody will be interested in that are very low. So go out with something new that you've written, something big and powerful and new, and not something that you've already. Um, put out there on the market that you can't consider a new publication. And that that would be my advice. Okay, great, great advice. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left and I, let me just throw it out there. Does anybody have any other just words of advice or want to tell a story about how they got there? I see a hand. All right, Elaine, I'm going to say any, any, any more stories that you want to tell. And then we might spend the last couple minutes just talking maybe about the nuts and bolts of after you get an agent, what, what those agreements look like. So, uh, Elaine. Well, I wanted to circle back a little bit to uh, what Maurice was talking about in terms of when you part ways with an agent. So one of the truisms is that it is worse to have a bad agent than to have no agent at all. When you have no agent, then you know that nobody's working for you. You have to do that work. You have to work with the editors. You have to do the research, and that's fine. When you have a bad agent, you think they're doing the job, but they're not. Uh, they may be falling down on making contacts. Maybe they're not sending the manuscript out. They are not following through with um, editorial notes. They're not doing a good job of negotiating a contract. And it can be a little bit hard to tell those things, especially if you're new to the business, especially if you're not firmly networked with a bunch of other authors who might say, hey, you know, your agent should really be getting 
And if they're not, it's a problem. So uh, when I had it to do over, because <laughs> I've done it a couple of times now, uh, I try to make, pay a lot more attention to those potential red flags to make sure that my agent and I are communicating clearly. And uh, if she says, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, then I want to know when to expect X, Y, Z to happen. And I'm going to follow up and say, hey, did you take care of X, Y, Z yet? Or, oh, you know, we talked about sending this manuscript out. Do you have your list of agents or do you have your list of editors rather that you're planning on sending to, uh, to try and stay on top of that a little bit more. One of the groups I belong to is called Novelists Inc. And it's a professional group for commercial fiction writers. Uh, you have to have published at least two books to be a member. And the average member has published 19. And they did a poll of members a few years ago and find out that people had um, fired their agents an average of two years after they thought they should. Don't be that person. <laughs> Once you start worrying about it, you got to, you know, knuckle down, talk to the agent, find out what's going on. And if the agency relationship is not working, then you need to move on for the sake of your career. That was it. Wow, thank you. Um, so. Lucianne, can you tell us what what does a, a an agency agreement just generally generally look at, look like in the last couple minutes? So we you've, you've looked for an agent, you've you've been successful, you got an agent. What does that agreement kind of look like? Sure, an agency agreement tells you uh, what the agent's commission will be, um, what uh, what happens uh, for leaving. In other words, it'll say that we take you know fifteen percent commission, what we take on foreign. Um, uh, you know, should we want to part ways that there'll be, you know, this window that we can finish out submissions, um, that we'll still be entitled to commission on any deals that we did, um, uh, that we are, are still entitled to handle sub rights for the deals we did, um, that, you know, it, it just basically lays out the, the terms of our agreement. And, um, that you know, should any of those terms change, they have to be agreed to in writing by all parties. Um, that's basically it. I, I forget if our agreement is two or three pages, but it's not very long. It um, it just basically lays out the agreement, um, and we tell authors if they have any questions to come to us. If there's been any wording, say because somebody's a hybrid author and they want to um, adjust any wording because there's an unusual situation. Um, we discussed that. So um, that's that's basically it. Um, it basically, like I said, lays out the agency agreement, um, the agreement between you and the author so that if anybody has any questions about the situation, they can go to the agreement and look it up. Okay. Uh, Tony, I saw your hand up. I just point out that not even even today, not all agencies have agreements. There's still handshake deals happen. I've had handshake deals with both my ad agents it hasn't caused any problems. I know that makes a lot of people anxious, but what my first agent said was that, if, and she was British, so I'm gonna to try to fake a British accent, it's not gonna work. And if we're gonna do each other the dirty, we're going to do each other the dirty no matter what, even if there's a contract. So let's not bother, like, okay. And we didn't have any problems. I mean, I, I fired her, but not because of, nothing to do with an agreement or lack of thereof. Okay. And, no, and this is true. And it's fine to not have an agency agreement. My first agency didn't. Um, my The agency I'm with now does. I'm actually glad they do because when I was with my old agency, um, a, an author behaved very badly. And um, and I'm glad that we now have an agency agreement, you know. Um, but, um, you know, it doesn't mean authors can't still behave badly. Of course, there are agents that behave badly as well. So, I, you know, I understand that. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm glad to have an agreement that, to protect both sides and a, a document that people can refer to. But but we I've also done it on a handshake when I was at Spectrum, so um, I've seen it done both ways as well. Okay, it, it, and about the last thirty seconds, Maurice, when you when you got that fourteen page uh, contract and you found and you found an agent, uh, are you, you know was, was that agreement in, in writing and 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 um, um, how do you think that's worked going forward? Um, let's see. I, I, I think the first one, I can't, I think there was an agreement eventually. Um, I, it's been so long. I can't remember what the nature of the agreement was, but I know recently, uh, with my current agent, 
uh, th there was been an agreement, but I mean, I'm, I'm on, uh, she's at the third firm since we've been together. Um, and so, and so I basically, so what I tell her is like, I travel with you. I didn't sign up with the agency. I signed up with you. So wherever you go, I go. Um, and so, uh, so that's why we've, we've just kind of rolled ever since. And, uh, and, and there was still a bit of a learning curve for, you know, what it meant to work with an agent, uh, uh, I'll give you a quick example. Um, like my, my my most recent book deal, uh, I, I have a I have an agreement with my agent that I'm not allowed to talk to editor uh, talk to publishers and, and editors and make an, make a deal on the spot. And that's you would think that wouldn't need to be a rule, but that's kind of a rule. She's had to say, you know, I, I, she get I, she gets nervous whenever I meet with an, an editor. Uh, but I'd met with an editor. An editor was asking me what I was working on, and I I kind of made a, a pitch on the spot of here's what I'm thinking about working on next. And then the editor was like, hey, as soon as you get an outline for that, pass it over here and we, we can move forward with that. And so then I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I'm still feeling my Wheaties all of a sudden, like, hey, Jen, hey, this is what I just did. And she's like, yeah, Maurice, of course it, the editor did that because that's a great idea. So why don't you write up the outline, write up three sample chapters and give it to me, not that editor. And uh, so I was just like, all right, well, fine. So I, I did that. And then she takes those three chapters in the outline. And the next thing I know, uh, I experienced my first auction uh, as, as a bunch of different publishers now are, are bidding on this project, which was a, uh, a terrifying experience for on my end. Uh, but it was great that I, you know, as my wife likes to point out, you know, you have an agent for a reason. Why don't you try listening to her? Um, so now I'm... Uh, I, I think I'm at my peak on, on the learning curve as far as that goes. I, I, I now know to listen to my agent. Uh, and uh, and again, uh, I think one of the, the, the last things I look for, one of the last things about having an agent is um, they, uh, the, there are opportunities obviously I can get on my own, but there's opportunities that they can get that I have no reach and uh, they have reach in circles that I have no pull whatsoever. Um, and that's what you want in an agent. You want someone who has a, a better relationship, a, a web of relationships than you, who can get those opportunities that you can't get on your own. So uh, that'd be my last parting comment. Well, that's great. I, and and some of the notes I took about you know just remember they're they're humans and it's a long term relationship. But it almost sounds like finding a good doctor. Um, uh, we are out of time, and I would like to thank uh, all of the panelists. And for those of you watching at home, please give a virtual round of applause and a um, um, thanks for the great discussion. I really appreciate the, the those answers. And uh, I need to remind everybody to please, please turn in your Gen Con tickets so that you get counted, so that the Writers Symposium gets credit for it and continue can continue to do all of the wonderful things that the Writers Symposium does. It's, it's my favorite event of the year. And uh, I can't wait to be back in person with everybody. Um, and I will... Leave it at that. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, Good night, everybody. Thank you.